Good morning, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. And while you're turning to Revelation chapter 6, I want to read from 1 Peter 3 verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us unto God. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that Christ suffered the just for the unjust? Well, God, is, as we've said many times, is a just. He's a holy, righteous, and just God. Years ago, when I first started driving, uh, I had to go before a judge. I didn't break the law, but I had a burned out headlight. And they gave me a ticket and they said, <laughs> for some reason, you have to go and get it fixed, bring the receipt showing you had the headlight repaired and take it to the judge. And I had to wait there with a bunch of criminals and I had to turn, had to turn in my receipt or show him my receipt. Now, so I've never really been before a judge for doing anything wrong. Maybe you have. But if you stand before a judge and you are guilty as you can be and the judge says, hey, I feel good today, I'm going to let you off the hook. He would be unjust. Sin has to be punished. Now, when 9-11 took place and they flew the airplanes into the World Trade Center and destroyed both the buildings, People all across America, and we had congressmen come down onto the steps of the Capitol, and they were demanding justice, justice. We want these people to pay. And, uh, and so uh, President Bush says, I hear you, and they're going to hear from us. And everybody was cheering. Now, if, if sinful people can demand justice, what about a perfect God who is perfectly righteous, and He is perfectly just, God cannot let us off the hook for sin. And in your lifetime, you know that you have sinned. I have sinned. We all have sinned except for Jesus Christ. Have you ever told a lie in your lifetime? Yes, you have. Have you ever stolen anything in your lifetime, even a piece of candy or a pencil at school or something? Yes, you have. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? You've used God's name when you didn't mean it. You just says, oh my God. Well, that's taking God's name in vain. That's blasphemy. Have you ever looked at somebody with lust? Jesus said, if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. We've all done that. Now, we're guilty as charged. So because of God's justice, He has to punish our sin. So Jesus Christ, God the Son, took on flesh... He became the perfect sacrifice for our sin. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's our sacrificial Lamb. His blood had to be shed. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there's no forgiveness. The life is in the blood. Jesus Christ was your sacrifice. He was your substitute. He took your place. You and I deserve hell for eternity. Jesus Christ took the equivalent of it upon Himself that you and I deserve. We're guilty, but the sentence was carried on Him. Carried out on Him. The fine was, He paid the fine. Three days later, he rose again from the dead, victorious over sin and death and hell and sin. That doesn't mean you're automatically going to heaven. You've got to be willing to turn from being your own God, calling the shots for yourself, to please yourself in everything, to meet your needs your way. If you feel lonely, you go out and have immoral sex. Or if you feel like a loser, you go out and shoplift or whatever it is. Or you go get, you get rid of your, your, your uh, sorrows by drinking or taking pills. Or you just want to be successful in the eyes of people and so you step on people. Or you promote yourself, you lift yourself up. Uh, whatever it is. And so God wants you to be willing to turn from that kind of lifestyle to faith in what Jesus did on the cross. He's the only way you're going to get to heaven. He's the only way you're going to be forgiven. And so no longer will you be God. You say, I'm not God. Yes, you are. If you don't know Christ, you are God. You are your own God. You've got to turn from that. It's idolatry. And turn by faith to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask Him to come into your life and forgive you and cleanse you. And He says, all who come to me I will not cast aside. So Jesus Christ promises... 
to those who trust Him as their Lord and Savior. They repent of their sin, trusting in Him. And He says, I give you eternal life. You will never perish. No one can snatch you out of My hand. No one can snatch you out of My Father's hand. I and the Father are one. That's a promise. 1 John 5 says, This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things have I written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God in order that you may know, K-N-O-W, that you have eternal life. Now, why do I go through that? It's because God is just and He will punish the sin of individuals. God will also punish the sin of nations. Israel sinned against God over and over and over, and they were His chosen nation. They sinned against God over and over and over when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after they left, left Egypt. Why did they have to wander around? Why did God lead them around in the desert for 40 years? It's because they griped and they complained. They refused to trust God. They tried to do things in their own strength. They, they turned to idolatry. And God says, this generation that has rejected me, they will not enter the promised land until they're all dead. And once they're dead, then their children will be allowed to come into the promised land. They hardened their hearts. Now, the world system today is called, in the Bible, the Greek word is cosmos. The cosmos is an organized system headed by Satan that leaves God out. For example, we said a week or so ago, when our kids were growing up, they had Sesame Street. Sesame Street didn't have pornography on it. They didn't have drug, drug use on it. They didn't have uh, alcohol. They didn't have cursing and swearing. They taught kids how to count and they taught kids how to read. But they left God out. They just leave God out. And some of you, perhaps, in your life, you're a nice person and everything, but you just leave God out of your life. Churchgoers will go to hell if they leave Jesus Christ out of their life. A lot of good people go to hell. Good people don't go to heaven. Righteous people who are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ go to heaven. A lot of good people are going to bust hell wide open. Now, Satan is called by Jesus Christ in, in John chapter 8. Satan is called a murderer and a deceiver. Satan is the deceiver and he is a murderer. So Satan's goal, because he hates God and because he hates God's creation and you were created in the image of God, he hates you. So he has a goal. He wants to deceive you into thinking that you don't need a Savior and you can live independently of God and then he wants to see you die and go to hell. He's doing that with everybody on the face of the earth. He's doing that with nations. When you go to the United Nations, which I've never been to, we've been in New York City, but I didn't care to go inside the New York uh, United Nations building. The United Nations, when they meet, they do not honor Jesus Christ. They do not honor the Lord. It's a secular organization, except for the Muslims who will kill people if you don't follow Allah. So we're headed, we're headed because Satan's in control. He's called the God of this world. God created it, but when Adam sinned, Satan became the prince of the power of the air, is what the Bible says. Satan's goal is to create a one world government where he heads it up working through the Antichrist. Anti means against. There's going to be an Antichrist. And he's going to rule on this earth for seven years. It's called the tribulation period. Satan wants to be the king of the earth. The Antichrist will be a charismatic ruler that everybody thinks is the coolest thing going. He's going to have all the answers they, they think for the world's problems. And so he's going to bring a false peace. And then one day he's going to declare himself to be God and all hell's going to break loose. We're headed toward the new world order that the first older President Bush talked about. The new world order, there will be a one world government that leaves Christ out. There will be a one world currency, we're heading that way. There will be a one world religion, we're heading that way as well. 
Everybody wants to come together. All the different religions are talking about coming together. The, the Pope, Francis, Pope Francis, he went over to the Muslim countries and he said, we all need to get together as brothers. We need to love each other as brothers. We all have the same God. And they're building a thing right now in the United Arab, Arab Emirates. They're going to have uh, a, 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 a synagogue for the Jews, a church. This is all like a, just a big buildings. A synagogue, a church, and a mosque in the United Arab Emirates. And they, they believe, you know, if you're a, if you're a pagan, they're, they're going to kill you if you don't agree with them. But they want to honor a one world religion where we all come together as brothers. It's going to happen. The book of Revelation talks about it. He goes into detail. Now, earlier in the book of Revelation, John was, God told him to come up here in chapter 4, verse 1. That's a picture of the church being taken off the earth and going to be with the Lord. John is called up to heaven. And so he sees, he sees uh, a, a throne and God the Father is on the throne. And he says, it has a scroll with seven seals on it. Who's worthy to open these, this scroll with the seven seals? And out of all the universe, no one steps forward. And John's, John was up there because he, God says, come up here, I'm going to show, show you what's going to happen in the future. John gets there and nobody can open the scroll that we talked about here. And so John's weeping and weeping and weeping. And then one of the, one of the uh, elders up there says, uh, don't weep. The, the lamb, the, the lamb of, of, of the, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb can open the scroll. And so he sees the lamb as if, as if it had been slaughtered. It looks like a lamb that had been killed. The only thing is the lamb's standing up. The lamb is alive. The lamb was killed 2,000 years ago. He rose again from the dead three days later. And he's alive, but he still has the scars. When he met with his disciples after he rose from the dead, he says, See the nail prints in my hands, my feet? Uh, Thomas, see the scar where they stuck, stuck the spear in my side? And in Isaiah chapter 52, it says his visage was marred more than that of any man. What does that mean? They blindfolded Jesus and beat him to a pulp saying, if you're the son of God, prophesy, tell us who hit you. Prophesy, tell us who hit you that time. Pro prophesy, tell us who hit you that time. And so his face was just beaten beyond recognition. He was a bloody mess. And so I feel sure today that when we see him face to face, you will see that scarred face as well as those scarred hands and that scarred feet and that spear place in his side where he was stabbed. Now, as we get to chapter 6, Jesus begins to open up the scroll. He begins to break the seven seals. And so we're going to go into chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Then I saw a lamb, <clears throat> then, I, then I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, those are those four seraphim that guard God's throne. I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. Now in the Greek, the original Greek, the and see is not there. It says just come. So he tells John, come. And I looked and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, but not an arrow. He had a bow and a crown that was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Okay, I remember watching the movie Rudy, the football movie. And he wanted to play football for Notre Dame. And he went into the dressing room one day and he says, oh, this is where he's naming all these famous football players for Notre Dame. And he says, this is where they had the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They had four guys that were bad football players and that back then they called them uh, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Well, these are the four horsemen right here of the Bible. And so the first one was a, a white horse and the person sitting on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. He has a bow, but no arrow. And he has a crown, but the Greek word in, indicates it's not a kingly crown. It's, a, a, it's a, a victor's crown. So if they ran in a race, whoever won the race, they put a wreath of leaves around it on his head. Or if you were a, a, a governor or some kind of official and everybody thought you were ruling really well, they would give you one of these, these laurel wreaths. 
But this is not a kingly crown. Now, a lot of people say this is Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one opening the scrolls. This is the Antichrist. Now, when Jesus comes back, he will not come back with a bow and he will not come back with an arrow. He's going to come back with a sword that comes from his mouth. And the Bible says the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And he's going to judge the nations with the sword that comes from his mouth with his word. But it's going to kill people. And the Bible says when they have the battle of Armageddon, the blood is going to be up to the horse's bridles. And so here, this is not Jesus Christ. It's the Antichrist. And so you have the Antichrist. Now when he comes and he conquers, how does he conquer? He doesn't conquer with weapons. He conquers with his ability to, to um, sway people. He comes with his ability to impress the world. He's so impressive. He's such a great speaker. And he seems to have an answer for all the problems of the world. And the whole world, later on we're going to see, they're going to bow down and follow him. And part of his solution to all the problems economically is that he's going to say, you have to have a mark that's going to go right here or here on the back of your right hand. And you cannot buy or sell anything without that mark. Now they say that that mark is the mark of a man and it's 666, but I have no idea what that means. So you're going to have a mark, they would have a mark here and a mark there. Now a lot of people are saying that it's going to be a microchip. Now they're, have, they're having those now and they're going to be so effective that they can put your financial history, your medical history, they can be able to track you, whatever it is. And during the, during the tribulation period when the Antichrist is ruling, you cannot buy anything and you can't sell anything unless you have that mark. But the Bible then says, if you take that mark, that means you're following the Antichrist, you cannot be forgiven for that. So if you take the mark here or in your hand, once you take that mark, you cannot be forgiven. You will die and you will go to hell. But now everybody has an opportunity to trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you harden your heart the way they did in the Old Testament, he says, harden not your heart as they did in the days of pro provocation. They provoked God to anger. And it says, because of their wicked unbelief. Matter of fact, I will turn there in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to just turn on there real quickly. And it says, <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter... Uh, 3 verse 7, today if you will hear His voice, and you're listening to the Word of God here this morning, that's His voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and they tried me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation, and I said they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Then he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. If you've rejected Christ, whether you think you're a good person or not, God says you have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Because if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are separated from God. And if you die without Christ, you will spend eternity separated from God in a place called, according to Revelation chapter 20, the lake of fire where you can't sit down or lay down, it's a lake of fire. They say you'd be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Jesus said it's a place of darkness. And Jesus said it's a place where there's no rest day or night. There's nothing to do. There's nobody to talk to. You're in isolation, total boredom, no place to go, nothing to read, nothing to listen to, no one to love you, no one to care. You can scream all day long. Nobody's going to hear you. You are isolated alone as if somebody took you on a hot summer day when it's like 115 degrees. They went over to the Baker Water Tower. They opened up the door, dropped you in the water when it's almost boiling, and they weld the door shut, and you're in total darkness. And, and heat is so hot you can barely breathe and you're all alone and you will never get out ever and ever and ever. And that is nothing compared to the lake of fire. Now, the Antichrist wants to deceive the whole world. And 
At that time, people think, oh, we're just fine. We're going to be fine. They don't even recognize that God is dealing with them. And because they're rejecting Christ, they're facing his judgment. Now, we're going to see as we go through this chapter, they're not going to get the picture until the very end. And then they're, all of a sudden, they will become aware we are facing the wrath of God. And they are so horrified they're begging the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and kill them. They want to die and they can't die. That's how bad it is. So let's go to this. The first rider on the white horse is the Antichrist. And he went out conquering and to conquer. He's going to deceive the whole world. Now, look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. today. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if you're a Democrat or what, but I'm not. And not because I hate Democrats, but I know sin when I see it. We have people ruling the United States of America today who are staying in power by deceit and lies. They are liars. And so because of that, we have people today who will follow them because they love lies. They have a pet sin that they want to keep legalized. They want to be able to sin and not, and not be punished for it. They want, to, they want to defund the police departments. They want to see all these other horrible sins like abortion and homosexual marriage and all that. They want to see that legalized because they love their sin. And because they love their sin, they hate the Word of God. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate you and me. They make fun of church and they hate people who love our Constitution, even though the Constitution is not the Bible. But it was cre created and written by people who had respect for the Bible, even though our modern historians deny that. Because I can give you a list a mile long of di different quotes from the Founding Fathers. And those, David Jeremiah, for example, I mean, not David Jeremiah, David uh, Barton. David Barton is an expert on American history. And I t he has a library of the original books that, the, that when they were printed, he, went and he was able to find the books. The first, the first edition of books that had the quotes of our founding fathers, he can show you in the book where the quotes came from. And there are different quotes that show respect for Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Now, that's the first horse. The second horse in verse 3. And he opened the second seal, and I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that the people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. What is that? That's war. Now, the Antichrist comes in, and he deceives the world into following him, and he doesn't have to shed any blood. But right after he comes into power, there's going to be a big war, revolt. Maybe some people are going to resist him ruling. But people are going to start killing each other. Now, we have people who came into power a year or so ago. And as soon as they came into power, or even up to the time they were coming into power, we had riots. They were burning down buildings. They were killing people. They go to, a police, to police officers who were sitting in their car, just shoot them in the head and kill them. They got away with it. Millions of dollars were burned up. People lost their jobs. People lost their lives. And nobody, they said, oh, well, they're having peaceful demonstrations. When you have someone ruling and reigning and they are living in sin and rebellion against God, you think there's going to be prosperity and you think there's going to be law and order and you think life is going to be wonderful, but you get the exact opposite and the problem with the United States of America is the same problem these people had here when the white horse came along. They did not recognize that God's judgment is falling upon them. The United States of America, it, God's judgment is falling upon us. We have murdered almost 70 million little innocent babies. The other day, this girl who's a teenager, she gave birth to a little baby. She didn't know what to do. She panicked, she said. So she got the little baby, wrapped him up in a towel and put him in a black trash bag, went over to a dumpster, and they got her on the security camera. She got out of the car, or her, yeah, her vehicle. She threw the baby in the dumpster and drove off. And he laid in that dumpster for six hours until some dumpster divers were looking for some free stuff and they found the baby and they're crying. 
we don't realize that God's judgment is falling upon this nation. And when you look at Jesus Christ, you can talk about God in America all day long because there's a lot of gods out there. Somebody says, oh, I gave my life to God. I said, which one did you give him to? Give it to. There's a lot of gods out there. But the name of Jesus Christ is politically incorrect. They don't want you to mention the name of Jesus Christ. They'll cut you off. If you're a football player. I'm going to give all the glory to God. Oh, they, they, they can take that okay. I'm going to give all the glory to my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll cut you off. You have this, uh, this guy with a big puffy hairdo that played football. What's his name? Kaepernick. He took a knee when they played the national anthem and everybody cheered him. Then you have Tim Tebow take a knee and pray before a ball game and they ran him out of the NFL because they hate Jesus Christ. So then, once these people fall for the rider on the white horse and they think he's going to be the answer to all their problems, all of a sudden, all, I'm going to use the word of the real hell, all hell breaks loose. And so it says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see, and another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to, uh, to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So you have riots and murder and killing. The third seal. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living creature saying, come, and come. So I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Famine's coming. This guy's now in control. He brought a, a moment of peace. Then all of a sudden there's war. People are killing each other. And that brings in famine. Worldwide famine. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, living creatures saying, a, a quart of wheat for a denarius. A denarius was a day's wages. They could get a quart of wheat for a day's wages. And three quarts of barley for denarius. You fed barley mostly to animals because it didn't have as much nutrition as wheat. You could get one quart of barley for a day's wages or you could get three quarts of, I mean, of wheat for a day's wages. <coughs> Excuse me. And three quarts or, or three quarts of bar barley for a day's wages. And do not harm the oil and the wine. What's that all about? When someone was injured or hurt or something, they would take oil, like the, when they had the Good Samaritan come by the guy who had been beaten by robbers. They put oil and they poured wine on it to disinfect it. Also, people had to cook using oil, and people also could, could uh, kill the bacteria in their water by pouring some wine into it. So God in His mercy is saying, don't harm the oil and the wine because everybody's going to need it. They're going to be killed all over the place, and then later on they're going to have famine all over the place. People are going to be starving to death. Then you go to chapter, uh, verse 7. So anyway, the second one, the second horse, that involves the economy. The first one, you have, you have the false peace. The second one, you have uh, riots. And then the third one, I'm sorry, you, it involves the economy. The economy starts going down the drain. That's what we're having here. Not that we're in the tribulation period, but this is like a picture, a little tiny little picture of what's going to happen, except it's going to be far worse. Then we have the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures saying, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the Greek word, the Greek word for pale is it's like a pale, pale, pale green, like a dead body. Now I worked with hospice. That, uh, Martha knows. I took care of Martha's mother. I worked with hospice for 11 years. I watched a lot of people die. And I've been there. I actually had to help dress people. I was at a lady's house. Her husband had died. And she says, I want him to go to the funeral home dressed in his tennis outfit, his tennis clothes. So I had to help the male nurse put his tennis clothes on this guy. And once they die, they begin to turn this kind of a pale kind of a color. You, you don't want to buy makeup to look like that unless you're Michael Jackson. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death. Death. And the name who sat on it was death and Hades. Now Hades is a word for the, the, the abode of the dead, the grave, and also sometimes it's used for hell. 
I guess Hades would be appropriate either way. <clears throat> Death and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth, and, and power was given to death and hell, or to Hades, was given to them over a fourth of the earth to be killed with a sword and hunger with de- uh, a fourth of the earth? Now, how, what's the population? About approaching eight billion people on the earth? If you have a fourth of the earth, that's two billion people that are going to die. Two billion, two billion, that's, you think COVID was bad. Two billion people are going to die, and it says they will kill with sword. They'll be killed with sword, hunger. They'll starve to death. They will be killed with death. Now, they'll be killed with death. It says, I'm going to kill you to death. What does it mean they'll be killed with death? There will be so, there will be so much chaos if you get sick with something, you can't find any doctors or anybody to take care of you. You will die because you don't have any medical care. A fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth? Oh, what does that mean? You got so many dead people, you got, you got two billion people who are dead. The wild animals are going to have plenty to eat and they're going to acquire a taste for human flesh. And if you're walking around and there's not a dead body nearby, you'll become a dead body very soon. I was reading yesterday where a young girl who uh, was single, I think she was in her 20s, and she loved to play the guitar. She went out to one of the national parks, and she was attacked by a pack of coyotes. And they got there and rescued her. The police, uh, the game warden, or the park, park police came with a shotgun, shot the biggest coyote, and he ran off. But later on, they found him. And so they killed several of the coyotes. Now they took her to the hospital and about an hour later she died. And they ate part of her. So when they killed the coyotes, they found her DNA in their stomachs. That's going to happen. All right, so then we have, oh, and, and the, all the, with these four seals that had been broken, the people on the earth still don't get the message. They still don't understand why all that's happening. They just think everything's going terrible. It must be President Trump's fault. They don't understand what's happening. They haven't gotten the message, but they're about to. He opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony. Now, when you had the altar, you're offering animals' blood, and it would drip down onto the, under the altar. These are people whose souls are under the, under, the, under the altar. They are people who are martyred. I don't think that's just the church. Those are people who have, all people who have loved the Lord and trusted in the Lord from the Old Testament all the way through to the tribulation period, who actually trusted in the Messiah during, when all this stuff breaks out, because somebody like y'all had heard about the tribulation period. Those people are begging for vengeance. God, when are you going to do something and and avenge our deaths? These people murdered us because we loved you. And so he says, those who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Because those that are going through all this have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior. Then a white robe was given to each of them. Purity, righteousness. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, as they were was completed. He said there are going to be more martyrs killed. There are going to be people who are going to turn to Jesus as their Messiah. There are going to be Jews who are going to come to Jesus as their, as their Messiah. And so... You, they will, you all will be avenged once all these martyrs have been killed. Then I'm going to turn my fury and wrath upon the, re- the leftovers. And then he says, I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Now, he didn't say an earthquake. He said a great earthquake. Now they had a big earthquake over in Japan a while back and the, the coast of Japan was moved to the east 18 inches. But there's a great earthquake and this is a worldwide earthquake. 
There's a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. Now, how would the sun be black? There's so much ash or whatever it is. It just, you can't see the sun. And the moon became like blood. There's so much stuff in the atmosphere. The stars of heaven fell to the earth. The stars? Maybe he's talking about meteors. I don't think real stars would fall to the earth, but they didn't have a word for meteors back then, or I don't know. The, uh, God, only God knows. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as, fig tree, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by, the, uh, by a mighty wind. Then this, listen to this. And the sky receded as a scroll. The stars and everything disappear. You go out at night, you can't see any stars. The, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Every one of them. You say, I want to go live in Tahiti. Uh, not, not during this time you don't. Unless you can surf on an island. And here they wake up. Here's where the world wakes up. The kings of the earth, the United Nations. The kings of the earth, the great men. All these billionaires. George Soros. The rich men. The commanders. The world uh, military leaders. The mighty men. Football players. <laughs> Whatever. Every slave and every free man, how did they respond? They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Oh, now they realize, now they realize what's going on. They're facing God's wrath. And they're facing it too late. If you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, you might be religious. You might have gotten baptized. You might even read your Bible. You might be a nice person. But if you have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you die in that state, it will be too late for you just as it's too late for these guys. And there are a lot of good people in hell. Somebody says, I don't believe that. It doesn't make hell any cooler. Hell is a long time to be wrong. Hell is a long time to be wrong. You say, well, I don't believe in all that stuff. Okay, then look at the opposite side. Look, look, at, look at America, if you live that long, if you live that far back. Look at how things were when people had a respect for the Word of God and Jesus Christ and church. Now look that we have no respect for the Word of God and Jesus Christ and the church. Is it better, was it better, is it better now or was it better then? We're more perverted in this country. We are sex crazy. We are money crazy. We were power hungry. We will kill our grandmother for a few dollars to buy drugs. When I was in high school, I didn't know what drugs were, except when the doctor said, I'm going to give you a penicillin shot. I learned to read real early when I was a kid. I went to see Dr. Perry. I was probably five, five years old. And he told my daddy, he says, he's going to have to have an, uh, an S-H-O-T. And I started screaming. And he said, what's wrong with your son? Mama says, he is S-M-A-R-T. <laughs> I don't know what happened. My brain has degenerated since then. And so it says, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. Wrath? Jesus Christ has wrath? Yes, he does. He's just. Jesus Christ died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. If you're unjust because you sin, you need a Savior who's just. Because if you don't get the Savior, you're going to end up with the judge. And you don't want to meet the judge if you've rejected Christ. Because He is just and He will punish your sin. And you will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So I don't want to think about it. Well, when you're in there for all eternity, you will think about it. You will be all alone forever and ever. You will never see anybody ever again that you know and love. You'll never see anybody at all. 
You can't turn on an air conditioner. You can't lay down and take a nap. It's a lake of fire. You can't even sit down. You can't lay down. You have nothing to do. You're totally bored. You're isolated. You live for your greatest need in your life is to be loved. And you have nobody to love you. There's no compassion for you. Because you have chosen to reject the compassion that God offered to you. This lady, there's a lady down here who was sleeping on the side of the highway for three or four days or a week. And you thought it was a pile of garbage, but there's a lady laying out there. She's all covered up with stuff. And she was just living out there. And people try to help her. Let us put you in a hotel. No, no, no. I don't. Well, let us get you a tent. No, I don't want a tent. And she didn't want any help from anybody. She rejected people's compassion. And finally, when this bad weather was moving in and all the rain and stuff, the police had to take her off somewhere to protect her from killing herself. That's a shame. You can't help somebody who doesn't want help. I hope if you're here and you don't know Christ, you're not a person who doesn't want help. Because one day you will cry out for mercy. If you stand before God's final judgment, the great white throne judgment, we'll study that in Revelation 20. And you will say, oh God, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And he's going to say, how long did you live? I live 65 years. How many seconds were in that 65 years that you experienced and you rejected Christ? How many minutes did you live and you rejected Christ? How many hours did you live and you rejected Christ? How many days did you live and you rejected Christ? How many weeks did you live and you rejected Christ? How many months did you live and you rejected Christ? How many years did you live and you rejected Christ? And I offered you mercy and you rejected it. No, it's too late. You rejected it. It's like these people right here. And all of a sudden when it was too late, they realized we messed up. For the great day of His wrath has come. And guess what the next phrase is? And who is able to stand? Nobody. I'm going to close with that. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you may not be a horrible person. You might be a nice person and everybody likes you. You might give money to St. Jude's Hospital or to the cancer fund. You might come to church all the time. You might have been in church all your life. But you have never gone to God and acknowledged that you are a sinner. I have sinned against you. I am in trouble. I am guilty as charged. I have no excuses. And if I make excuses, you won't accept them because I made the choice to sin. And I have rejected you up to this point in my life. But right now, I finally understand it. It's like that guy who was an atheist, the, the biker. And he sat down on the couch after I talked to him and he says, quote unquote, oh my God, I'm going to hell. And he burst into tears. He said, I'm in trouble. I said, yes, you are. And let me tell you what hell's like. Then he was terrified. And I said, let me tell you the best news that you're ever going to hear. Jesus Christ was God in a human body and He shed His blood for you. You're guilty. He paid your fine. The sentence was carried out on Him. He did that because He loves you. And three days later, He rose again from the dead. And if you will turn from your life of sin and trust Him as your Savior and invite Him to come into your life, He says, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And He said, I want Jesus... He said, the first time I've ever understood this, I want Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I said, well, ask Him to be. And He started crying. He said, Lord, I've been living in sin. I've been doing drugs. I've been immoral. I've done all these things. And I'm guilty. And I, I know that You're my Savior. I know that You're God in the flesh. And You died for me on the cross. I want You to come into my life and make me a child of God and he did that and when he died he was in the bed in the bedroom and he says honey could you you and the family come in here let's pray together so they prayed and then he prayed and he got a big smile on his face and he was gone went to be with Jesus that young man who was working on his car he was in his late 30s early 40s had a morphine pump. He had colon cancer. He was in a lot of pain. 
He's piddling around under the hood of his car. I talked to him and I said, how are you coping with your diagnosis? He said, I'm terrified. Why are you terrified? He says, I'm going to die and I don't know what's going to happen to me when I'm dead. I said, would you be interested if I showed you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? You don't have to hope so. You know for sure. I didn't know you could know for sure. Let me show you. I went through what Jesus did for him on the cross. And he said, I want that. And he asked Jesus Christ to be a Savior. And he just lost all um, restraint of his emotions. He grabbed me. He started crying. You've heard me say this. He started crying and he just, his tears covered my shoulder, the shirt, my shirt, shoulder shirt, shoulder on my shirt, covered my shirt with tears. A few months later when he died, I was in West Virginia. Visiting, we were visiting our son at Appalachian Bible College. One of the nurse, some of the nurses and one of the other chaplains was there and he was laying there in a hospital bed in the living room. He was unconscious, near death. And the other chaplain told me, he, they said, he, all of a sudden he opened his eyes, he looked up, and he got a radiant smile, and he says, Lord Jesus, I see it, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. And he closed his eyes and he's gone. You're going to die one day. This is your day, if you've never trusted Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for how good you are. And I pray for anybody here in our church or anybody on Facebook or anybody on YouTube if they hear this. And I know, Lord, many people won't hear it because they're not interested in you. But I pray that someone will come to know Christ as their Savior before it's too late. Thank you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.